live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. Can we end the Marcus Mariota experiment? Please? I mean, for crying out loud. I don't know if Desmond Ritter is the guy, or if he's any good, but it's at least worth a shot to see what you have in him and see if you need to draft a quarterback in 2023. Because man, Marcus Mariota just isn't it. And the fact that after this embarrassment against Carolina yesterday, that head coach Arthur Smith can go up there and say that he looks every week to make sure the team has the right guys in the right spot, and yet trotted out Mariota throughout this entire game, is an absolute joke. Because if that was the case, and you truly thought that you had Marcus Mariota in the right spot, and you had confidence in him to get it done, and never once thought about pulling him for Ritter, then you wouldn't have done this. You wouldn't have been such a spineless, gutless coward at the end of the first half by calling, quite possibly, one of the worst plays of the entire season. You wouldn't have called the play that is the exact opposite of the message that you're trying to get across. And you wouldn't have called the play that shows that you have zero confidence in your quarterback. Because holy cow, we need to talk about what Arthur Smith did at the end of the first half. For those who aren't watching this in the immediate aftermath of the game, here's a brief recap of how we got to this point. It's November 10th, 2022. It's week 10 of the NFL season. And as we're entering the second half of the season, we have a rainy, wet, and big NFC South game on our hands between the Carolina Panthers and the Atlanta Falcons. No, I am not joking when I say that. Even though the Panthers enter at 2-7 and, and the Falcons enter at 4-5, and five, this game is absolutely huge. If the Panthers win, not only do they improve to 3-7 and seven and move to one game back of the division lead, but considering the fact that they would be 3-1 and one in NFC South play, they actually position themselves nicely to win this godforsaken division. If the Falcons win, then they would improve to 500 and would jump to first place in the NFC South for the time being. It's a big game in front of a national audience on Thursday Night Football, and if it's anything like the last time these teams met 10 days before, when the Falcons won a 37-34 overtime thriller that still doesn't feel real, then we are in for a treat. Yeah, we were not in for a treat this time around. Because what we got instead was a giant slugfest, where the Falcons fell behind 13-0 in the first half and looked completely inept on offense. On Atlanta's first four drives of the game, they only crossed midfield once. Marcus Mariota was having quite the stinker of a game, as through those first four drives, he was just 4 for 8 with 36 yards passing, no touchdowns, one interception, and a passer rating of 22.9, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. He was really bad. However, even though things were looking understandably bleak for the Falcons, especially since they didn't get the ball to start the second half, they still had time for one more drive to maybe get something going into the halftime break, and maybe get some momentum and take something positive away from this first half offensively. They have the ball with 147 left and one timeout. Plenty of time to go down the field and maybe get a touchdown to cut it to a one possession game. And sure enough, Mariota and the offense finally start clicking in this two minute drill scenario. It takes the Falcons just one play, following a Marcus Mariota pass to rookie wideout Drake London, to get the Falcons past midfield following an unnecessary roughness penalty. And it takes the Falcons just four plays, following two completions by Mariota and two runs by second-year running back Avery Williams to get just outside the red zone and in field goal range. So far, so good. The bad news is that on the ensuing play, the quick pass to Drake London doesn't quite go according to plan, as even though he picks up five yards, he can't get out of bounds, meaning that the Falcons have to burn their third and final timeout, which is not ideal. But okay. Even though this kind of stinks, you've still got plenty of time to take some shots to the end zone. You're at the 17-yard line, you've got 21 seconds left, so no matter what happens, unless you turn the ball over, you're going to have a highly realistic shot at three points. You've got a first-round rookie-wide receiver in Drake London, who's really good and is 6'4". You've got one of the best tight ends in football in Kyle Pitts, who's 6'6". Six you can definitely have time for one or two plays to the end zone where you throw it up to them if you get the matchup and hope for the best. 
So with that in mind, let's see what the Falcons have in mind here. Let's see what brilliant play they have drawn up for this situation. And throws to Patterson low, but he's able to collect it. Move, move. Are you, are you, are you actually kidding me? A two yard pass over the middle of the field? You're not even gonna try for the end zone? You're not even gonna make an attempt with all that time to cut it to a one possession game? Are you serious right now? At this point, they're just playing for the field goal. Right. Clock here. And that's exactly what they're gonna do right now. Just spike it there. Welcome to Dumb Decisions. Before I break down what happened here, this whole series is about taking an in-depth look at decisions made during games that were clearly awful from the start. This isn't something to look bad in hindsight. Rather, this is something that looked awful almost immediately. These are moves where your gut instinct tells you right away that there is no way this can possibly work. And sure enough, your gut instinct was smarter than that of an NFL head coach. And for this one, we're taking a look at the minds of Atlanta Falcons head coach Arthur Smith. I can't quite figure out Smith as a head coach. On one hand, it seems as though with the talent on this roster last year and this year, or lack thereof, he's overperformed. On the other hand, some of his decisions have been absolutely baffling to say the least, and this game against the Panthers might have been his worst coach game ever. You had a 4th and 10 play, where Kyle Pitts, your 6'6 pass-catching tight end weapon, was asked to pass block. You had the decision to leave Marcus Mariota in the game the whole time. You had a really questionable final play call, where the Falcons had the ball down by 10 with 4 seconds left, and instead of just taking a knee, decided to call one final play, even though someone could have gotten hurt. And the most egregious example might have been this play at the end of the first half, where he just decided to wave the white flag with his team right outside the red zone. This game was not his finest moment by any means, and the end of the half was the most frustrating moment of what was a very frustrating game to watch from a coaching perspective. So with that being said, let's take a look at why not taking any shots to the end zone when you have 21 seconds left, and why calling a surrender play is a bad idea. As always, I like to look at things from a risk-reward standpoint. So with that, we have to look at the risk and reward of taking a shot at the end zone versus the risk and reward of doing whatever the Falcons just did by calling a play where they're waving the white flag. Let's start with taking a shot at the end zone. Of course, the reward is obvious. If you succeed, you score a touchdown and you cut it to a one-possession game. Plus, you have the weapons to do it. Drake London is a monster. Kyle Pitts is a monster. This is why you have those guys on your team. It's not like you've got tiny receivers and don't have the personnel to win these matchups. You're probably better suited for these types of situations more than any other team in the league. If not now, when? This is like going golfing, and you brought this brand new driver because you can hit it 300 yards comfortably with it, and you play 17 holes, and it's been sitting in your bag the entire time, and now you're on the 18th and you're down by one stroke, and this is a 300-yard drivable par 4. If you're not going to use the driver now, then why did you buy it? You are well equipped to take shots at the end zone here. Of course, taking shots at the end zone comes with some risks but none of them are risks that I would say hold any weight or merit whatsoever. There are two possibilities for a bad play here. You could get sacked, or you could throw an interception. Well, Marcus Mariota hadn't been sacked all day, as the Atlanta offensive line, at least at the time of this play, was doing a pretty good job protecting him and keeping him upright. And if he does get sacked, let's say in the worst case scenario, you lose 10 yards. Alright, so that pushes it back from the 17-yard line to the 27-yard line. You still have plenty of time to get back to the line of scrimmage and spike the ball to stop the clock, since you snap that thing with 21 seconds left. Time isn't an issue at all in that regard. You will have time to kick the field goal. And with the field goal, Young Kwe Koo would be kicking from 44 yards out instead of 34 yards out. Since 2020, from the 40 to 49-yard range, Ku has hit over 86% of his kicks. He's been one of the best kickers in football. No, that's not the same as what he is from the 30 to 39 yard range, where his percentage is higher and he's hitting on 95% of his kicks, but come on. It's not like if you get sacked, you're taken out of field goal range, 
where you make this kick go from a surefire thing to a toss-up. If you get sacked, and again, you can't think like that and think scared when you haven't had a sack all day and you need a touchdown, you're still going to have insanely good odds at making the field goal. Which leads us to the second possibility for a bad play. And that, of course, is if Marcus Mariota throws an interception. But again, I have to ask this valid question. If you are coaching a team, you're in a spot with high odds in your favor, where you need a touchdown, and you're coaching scared to the point where you don't trust your quarterback to do the right thing, and you're scared that he's going to throw an interception and make a mistake, then why do you have him in the game? Why are you playing him if you're surrendering when you need him to do something good? You see why this would lead you to be under fire, right? You see why people are calling for Desmond Ritter if you feel that way, right? It's like if you're managing a baseball team. There's two outs. It's the bottom of the ninth. You're down by one. There's a runner on second, and you decide to leave your batter in the game who's been struggling and is 0 for 5 thus far instead of bringing in a pinch hitter. And then, with no shift on whatsoever, you order said batter to lay down a bunt. Like, why are you playing him at that point if you're not even going to try to put your faith in him? So just to recap what happens if you take a shot at the end zone. The reward is that you have two chances to throw it up to some of the best jump ball guys in football, come down with it, score, and make it a one-possession game. The risk is that you get sacked, which hadn't happened all day. But if you did, you go from a chip shot field goal to still a highly makeable field goal, or that you would throw an interception. But that raises the question of why your quarterback is even in the game in that case. In other words, this play is super low risk, super high reward. And might I add, a super necessary reward considering how the complexion of the game was going and considering the fact that Carolina got the ball to start the second half. Now let's look at option two, which is what they wound up doing by just calling a quick pass play that had no shot at getting to the sideline, that had no shot at scoring, and that was always going to be the final chance of the half. Not only does this play technically have the same risks as the first option, as you could still have some trouble with the snap, or get sacked, or have a holding penalty, or throw an interception, but it comes with none of the rewards either. What was the purpose of this play? What was the objective? Let's say Mariota throws the ball better on the angle route, leads Patterson, and he picks up 10 yards, because we all know he's not scoring, since he didn't design the play like the Tyreek Hill Hail Mary play, where you dump it off short, have the receivers go out and block, and then let him use his speed. Let's say that happens. You move the ball from the 17-yard line to the 7-yard line with no time left to do anything but kick the field goal. And again, I am being super generous by giving him 10 yards in the best-case scenario. If you do that, you're making it a 24-yard field goal. In his career, in that 23-25-yard to 25 yard range, Ku is a perfect 5-for-5. Five five. You know what he is in the 33-35-yard to 35 yard range, which is where you are right now? A perfect 7-for-7. Seven seven. Historically speaking, even if this play works perfectly, you took a 100% field goal and turned it into a 100% field goal. You did nothing to improve your odds. This is the NFL equivalent of in basketball, when you're down by 3 points with 4 seconds left, and you have the ball, and you go for the quick 2. I'm genuinely baffled as to Arthur Smith's logic here. Legitimately, when you consider the risks involved, the Falcons would have been better off calling no play at all and taking a knee than calling this cowardly play at the end of the half. It was that bad. So what do we learn from all this? If you need a touchdown at the end of the half and you find yourselves in a prime position to score a touchdown, then for crying out loud, go for the touchdown. If you have weapons, then use them. Don't leave them on the shelf and let them catch dust especially when they could be extremely vital here. If you're scared of your quarterback making a mistake in this situation, and your coaching is scared, then either it's time to find a new profession, or it's time to make a quarterback switch and go with someone that you have confidence in. And if you're calling a play to increase your chances at scoring, make sure the design of the play actually, you know, increases your chances at scoring, and isn't completely and utterly worthless in the grand scheme of things. Because when all these elements are in play, you can't exactly be surprised when this play backfires.
Talk about a dumb decision. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.